So um, I'm Laura and I uh, have been in schools a little over 20 years. My background is school social work. So I was a school social worker. I've met, worked for in special ed, I'd say for most of my career. And then um, about 15 years ago, transitioned to um, working at the district level as a PBIS coach, restorative practices, um, and then became a district administrator for um, implementing well-being programs, wellness programs for um, a large school district in California and Napa. And um, so that's how I came to this. And then about three years ago, I moved overseas with my family for a big adventure and have been doing international schools and then schools in the States. I do a lot of, of work with them. Um, I have a YouTube channel, so you guys can like search my name up on YouTube and find all kinds of videos and I have, a, you know, a website and a blog and I'll, I'll kind of show you that as we go. Um, uh, so I'm really glad to be here today. The beginning of, um, well, I'll kind of tell you how I found out about PBIS too, because I was a social worker for about, you know, probably 10 years um, and I would be in special ed. So I would have to, you know, go down the hall and pull kids out of class for counseling. And I would bring my little group of kids down, you know, in elementary and I've worked middle and high as well, you know, do these counseling groups and help build some skills. And then I'd put them back in class and then everything would fall apart, right? They couldn't hold it together. And um, so when I first heard about PBIS, I was in a big conference room in Colorado and um, and the the speaker, he said, there's more of them than there are of us. The only real change has to be the entire school environment. It can't be one child at a time. And that got my attention because it was absolutely what I had been seeing. And, um, and so I'm gonna describe to you what the researchers found and how PBIS came to being. And so that helps us kind of understand the why behind it. We're also gonna be talking today a little bit about stress, teacher stress and student stress and why we get the behaviors we do, why people are burning out and why PBIS is actually a solution for some of that. The first question I have for you, and I want you to do a turn and talk in your room, and this is like a warm up question. And the question that I have, and I, and I want you to find one partner, okay? Not the whole room, because otherwise not everyone speaks. And the question I have for you right now is, why did you get into education? What inspired you to be here? All right, so turn to, your, to a partner and, um, Go ahead and answer that question. I'll give you about three minutes. So likely everyone, you didn't get into education thinking, I love dealing with behavior, right? That's not why you started, right? You didn't get started because, you know, um, you wanted to be burned out or resent your colleagues or resent the district office, right? That, that's not why we got into it yet. That can be pretty consuming stuff. So I have good news for you today. Um, we're gonna talk about why we're stressed out and then we're going to talk about what the solutions to that are and why the solutions, why do kids misbehave? We're going to um, really get into then not just the why, but some solutions. Today's um, is really about an overview of what used to be about a three day training. In the past, PBIS would be rolled out in usually a full three day workshop, but we're going to do something differently now that we're online and working with um, Jen and with Maggie about how to roll this out better and maybe a little more flexibly for you. So today's gonna be an overview of kind of what you could get done in a year, really, realistically, um, to get this work moving. And then some options of how you can get this done um, in a digital way. Basically, um, what we're working on is setting up um, a series of videos that you could show to your staff so that you could bring your staff along. Instead of sending everybody to a training or sending just a team to a training, you could actually bring your entire student, your whole school staff along. You know, one of the issues with professional development and education is you send, you know, the five people from your school and everybody gets excited about whatever the new initiative is. And then you go back to your school and then nothing happens because it's only five people trained and you're doing your best, but things fall flat. So I believe after at least 15 years of doing this work, I'd rather go slower, <laughs> I'd rather go deeper, and I'd rather bring everyone along. And if that means taking 15 minutes of a staff meeting to talk about it, make some community agreements, rather than sending five people away to a three-day training, I think it's better, personally. I don't know about you. 
Um, so we're working on a plan that would look something like that, that would be year long with, um, you know, a year of coaching for you and some training that you could deliver to your staff sites. Um, Maggie, is there anything you want to add to kind of what that plan or what you're hoping for in that for them in terms of like moving forward with implementing? No, I think that's perfect. I think that mm -hmm. um, that was what we had had talked about and I have multiple screens going. So I look at the screen, it doesn't look like I'm looking at you all, but um, uh, <laughs> is that, you know, exactly what, exactly what you said, Laura, just being able to, you know, we could have also done, she has a training that's kind of just self-paced, but we really felt like this hybrid version, we're having the leadership team yeah. participate and have the why, and then being able to take those snippets and bring your teams yeah. along was kind of the, the, a, a good medium of moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's new, you know, so we're going to work it out, but I'm going to be with you guys the whole way. So that'll be neat. We have actually dedicated time that I can spend with each school each, you know, each month. Um, and we can meet as groups, we can meet individually, so we can work on that what, what works best for you. So just in the beginning, I want to let you know that this is not a one and done, a spray and pray. We're going to like build on this. And so this is an overview for the work that you need to try to work on this year. Sound good? Um, so let's go back and let's talk about why educators are so stressed. Research shows that these are the six main reasons the educators are stressed. High job demands, poor working conditions, lack of autonomy, student misbehavior, poor relationships at work, and poor school climate. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to reflect on this list and tell them what you think it is, what it is mainly for you. Because I'm assuming that there's stress in this room right now. This has been a rocky start for schools across the nation, across the world. Um, what is it for you on this list that really is the hardest thing? And maybe there's something that's like, you know, that, that, that part doesn't bother me. Autonomy doesn't, I like my team, right? That doesn't bother me. This is hard for me. So go ahead, take one minute, share what's the hardest thing for you. So let's come back. So this is a really typical list across multiple studies that I researched. This list comes, you know, comes back and back again. Things like high job demands. That's also called like workload, right? It's just a lot. Poor working conditions are thing, everything from like the condition of your school to not being able to go to the bathroom when you need to go to the bathroom, right? How many professions actually have a situation where an adult cannot use the restroom when they need to go, right? It's tough. It's tough. You can't just take a break. Um, lack of autonomy is this idea that a lot of people don't really want to be told what to do. They want to just have their classroom, shut the door, do their thing. Um, you know, the state tells you you have to do this. The district tells you you have to do this. And you're like, not, not interested. You don't believe in it. Student misbehavior, that's what we're going to talk about today. Poor relationships at work and poor school climate. So these are the main stressors. So what ends up happening is we have burnout which is actually a term and it was coined a while back back in the 70s it's very real and it it kind of i mean a lot of people have different different definitions of burnout but really you're looking at this emotional exhaustion you have nothing left to give depersonalization like distancing yourself from your students from your colleagues because you just you can't take it anymore and just a decreased sense of accomplishment so think about when you turned and talked to your colleague about why you got into education, and there's a distance from that when you become burnt out. You don't feel like you've achieved that. You're like, why am I here? Am I making a difference, right? And what's interesting is statistically, 20 to 30% of teachers feel this. And I would wager that it's probably higher right now. People are having a really difficult time transitioning back. As much as people said they missed their students when they were on Zoom, and in their you know zoom classrooms instead of in person and they couldn't hug each other and they also are completely overwhelmed going back a lot of people have forgotten their skills they forgot all these like classroom management tricks that they used instructional strategies that they used to just use and then they have to like be reminded of those things and now over 50 percent of medical professionals are also burnt out so some of the most burnt out stressed professions right so let's talk about stress about for your stress first, before we even go any further, we're gonna talk a little bit about your brain. 
So human beings have a stress cycle, which is different than your stress source. We just talked about the six things that stress you out. Your body has its own process of how it deals with stress. So let's think about back the way that human beings were created. Um, so normally what would happen is if you saw the bear in the woods, that's your stressor, your, your brain would go into what we call like fight, flight, freeze. So you would run, run. You would start shouting for help. Help, help, you're running toward your village, right? And the village, they come out and they help you defeat the bear. Then you're safe. You hug each other, you cry, you have this whole emotional release, you celebrate, you run, you know, march around the fire, you skin the bear, and you relax. That is how your body is meant to deal with stress. So now, Think about when you're sitting in a staff meeting and the person across from you says that obnoxious, irritating, or racist, misogynistic remark, right? <laughs> or your student gets in your face and says, F you. Like, you don't get to run, right? You can't leave. Although we're seeing a little more of that. Um, you don't get to fight. You don't get to like hit or yell. And so we actually are left with one remaining thing, which is to freeze. And human beings, interestingly, it is in that order. Our first choice is to, is to flight. We like to run away first. Second is we'll fight back. And the very last thing that human beings will do is freeze. So like imagine an animal, like a gazelle running from the tiger or from the lion, I should get my, my uh, continents correct. Um, they will first run away. You know, then you might see gnashing and trying to fight back. And only then when they're down for the count and that lion goes off to go get the rest of the, the folks to come, you know, feast, they'll play dead and then they'll run off. Right. So when you think about our students that are in that freeze state, they've tried everything else. Right. And when you're in that freeze state, you've probably tried everything else. Um, and so what happens is we are not able to like go through the stress cycle the way that our bodies need us to. So we're stuck in this perpetual stress state, which then impacts our bodies and has all these negative health outcomes and contributes to burnout. So we talked about what some of your stressors are from that list, but I want you to turn to your partner and that this is not a table talk discussion quiet discussion with your partner and talk about what are some of your stressors and it may be like family stuff it might be your students it might be some stress with colleagues i'm not saying you have to drop names or anything like that but what are some of the things that are contributing to your stress some of the stressors so take a couple minutes and and share two people please maybe three if you have to okay let's have everybody back so you've just had a chance to kind of think about what stressors most people list. And then you had a chance to share kind of what are yours, um, maybe broader than as an educator, but just as a human being, right? As a parent, a child of someone caretaking all those responsibilities that you have. Um, so what we need to do now is talk about that stress process, right? So not only have you probably not been able to get through what your body needs you to do to like get rid of the stress hormones in your body. Um, but those stressors keep coming every day, right? So what you need to do as a healthy human being is deal with the stressor, you know, like have a way to talk to people about the way that they speak to you disrespectfully or whatever it is. Deal with the stressor of kid misbehavior deal with the stressor of not getting along with your colleagues. You need to be able to deal with those things and you need to deal with the stress itself, meaning self care. Now, what a lot of these kind of trainings do is they say, let's have a self care workshop so that teachers can take care of themselves. You need to go get a massage and you need to like do yoga and you need to do meditation and all these things. I don't know about you, but personally, sometimes um, I get upset about that. And I know my, my husband has been in education for about 15 years as a teacher, math, secondary math teacher. And he's like, if I have to go to one more of those self-care workshops, I'm going to scream. And, and the reason is that 
it's almost as though you're being told it's your fault. Oh yeah, you just need to get a massage and then you'll be fine, right? Whereas I listed six reasons people are stressed that are not about you. They're not about you not getting a massage, right? Being overworked, not being able to take bathroom breaks, kid misbehavior, um, difficult colleagues. That is, those are very real. And to tell you that a massage is gonna fix that, it's insensitive and it's inaccurate and not helpful. So we're gonna spend just a, just a couple minutes so that I can tell you kind of where that fits and where self-care would fit and to think about doing some of those things. But then we're gonna dive into some solutions to prevent the stressors themselves, okay? So some of the things that research tells us ways for you to finish your stress cycle you know i see the bear i need to run so you need to have some things that help your body trick your body into thinking i'm safe in the arms of my community right now i can cry i can relax we can dance around the fire right you need to tell your body you're safe one of the most efficient things the most efficient thing to do and this is why every doctor tells you to do it is to exercise 20 to 60 minutes most days. So think about it. That fight, flight, freeze thing. When you're running through the forest, your body thinks you've escaped, right? The, the bear. So you're, by exercising, you're flushing your system of all of the stress hormones. Cortisol primarily is what we're talking about. That's why stress makes you feel better. Why, why exercise makes you feel better when you're stressed. Breathing is also very effective. So breathing in, one great trick is in five seconds and then out 10 seconds, and then you do it three times. The reason that this works is you're now telling your body that not only have you run away from the bear, but now you're safe. You can breathe. So that's why it tells your brain you're safe and it flushes out those hormones and makes your body healthier. So let's try it. Everybody sit up straight. We are going to breathe in five and breathe out 10. Ready? In one, two, three, four, five. Out by 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. In by five. One, two, three, four, five. Out. One, two, three, four, five six seven eight nine ten one more time in one two three four five out one two three four five six seven eight nine ten even that you feel differently your brain feels differently right now this is why people do mindfulness activities in their class, brain breaks. There's absolutely science behind those things. The next thing is connection, talking to someone, even like to God, to a higher power. It doesn't have to just be with human beings. Also, people find that like connection in nature, being there helps. So do you know how I asked you to turn and talk to a colleague about what was stressing you out? Science has shown that simply by expressing what's going on with you, expressing your feelings basically reduces, reduces the intensity of those emotions. In some sort of amazing way, human beings transfer, they feel that it's shared. They feel that when they express their needs that it's shared with whoever that they gave it to, um, which is um, wonderful. And it can go very, very wrong. So think about gossip. Gossip is your innate desire to share your pain and your body's desire to connect, but it's misguided because gossip doesn't just like reduce your stress. You feel much better after you gossip and talk bad about the district office, or can you believe that that parent said that, or can you believe that my, or my principal said that? So you feel better, but you've just basically vomited on the person next to you who now has to carry it. And we talk about gossip is like um, swimming, you know, you're in a pool and someone pees in the pool. 
right? You feel better, but everyone else has to swim in it. So think about like, yes, I feel a need to connection, but I need to either choose who I do it with. So you can like talk bad about whoever when it's people like call your cousin in Utah, like that would be cool. Um, and then all they have to do is just agree with you. Completely, I agree with you, right? That's all they have to say. But be careful about gossiping to your colleagues because it's gonna increase their stress. Um, unless you're really problem solving and talking about an issue, right? But connection is very powerful. The next one is affection, physical affection. It can be everything from hugs and kisses to petting your dog, right? That's physical, absolutely proven to reduce your stress. So there's this concept, I don't know if you guys have heard about the six second kiss or the 20 second hug. It takes about that amount of time for your body to like, you can't still be mad at your partner and kiss them longer than six seconds. <laughs> And you can't really be mad at someone with the 20 second hug, but you both have to want it, right? You can't make someone do it. You can't hold them in a bear hug for 20 seconds and not release them. That happened to me one time. I did not like it. Um, but yeah, there's some funny kind of science about these things. And there's some interesting research on giving yourself a hug. I'm not kidding. You actually can. It's not quite as intense, but you could like give yourself a good squeeze and hold yourself and you feel better. Um, so that's pretty great. Laughter, huge. So think about having fun moments with your staff, like barbecues and having circles and doing jokes on people actually has evidence to reduce people's stress. So the next time they do that stupid like icebreaker activity in a staff meeting, there is a reason for that. So think about doing funny things as a staff because it's gonna make people less stressed. Crying helps. It releases some neurotransmitters that help you feel better, help relax you. Um, not that you got to choose that wisely. You can't just crawl under your desk and cry at work, or at least, you know, I've been known to cry in a closet or two at work a couple times in my career. We've all done it. But you try to kind of um, avoid that one at work, uh, go home for a good cry. And then the last one is actually creative expression. Um, think about, and this actually includes um, sports. So when you're in a sporting event, which actually combines breathing and exercise, right, with sports, but also like painting, arts, poetry, they create a cultural loophole where you're allowed to go con to a concert and scream your head off, right? You're allowed um, as a man to show physical affection in a sporting event. You can slap people in the butt, give them a big hug, right? Whereas culturally, we're pretty rigid. We're not allowed to do that sort of thing. Um, you can express yourself in creative ways. So this is a really great way also to finish your stress cycle. So as a group, I want you to talk to your partner again. What are ways that you can finish your stress cycle? So choose a few of these strategies that could work for you. So turn to your partner and say, I do this, I'll, do, I'll try this, I'm willing to give this a shot. Okay, go ahead and talk. Okay, let's have everybody back now. So when you think about next time you have a self-care checklist or someone asking you or talking about their own self-care routines, think about what we learned today about your stress cycle and how those things can contribute and why they work. So getting a massage, right? That's like connection and affection, right? Basically it's physical, physical like affection. Your body is feeling it. People that go walking every day, um, that has to do with the daily exercise part. And people that are doing mindfulness and yoga, that has to do with exercise and breathing, right? So thinking about people that decide that I'm gonna watch, you know, reruns of Friends so I can laugh really hard, that's laughter. Some people like to watch really sad movies and have a good cry. All of these things contribute to your self-care in a very scientific way. And that is why next time you go to one of those workshops, instead of screaming, <laughs> like I can't go to another one of those things um, or someone telling you to eat better and exercise, right? Um, this is why it works. This is the, the science behind it. So we just talked about ways you can finish your stress cycle, but let's talk about children. So kids have their own kind of process that they follow, except the thing for kids is that they have very learned behavior then that is generated from stress that they experience. And that learned behavior impacts you quite a bit. 
So how many people here, raise your hand if you've heard of Vince Felity's study, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. So raise your hand, awesome. So a lot of people here have had some training around trauma-informed schools, looks like. Um, so all of these things that we're gonna talk about, they all go together. And my, um, my hope for you today is that we can talk about why they all fit and then how that leads us to some solutions. It's one thing to know a lot about like brains and know about trauma, but what do you do about it in an organized systematic way? Not just how you run your classroom, but how do you run your whole school? So Vince Felity was, um, was a, a doctor in Kaiser Permanente in California, in San Diego. And he was in charge of the obesity clinic. And he thought, you know, I wonder why some people seem to be obese, other people aren't. And I wonder if there are some things in their childhood that maybe led to their medical condition right now. Because the more he was like talking to his patients, they all had like kind of some similar stories. So he did a big study where he was able to interview um, and look into the medical records of about 17,000 patients at Kaiser. Now, these are all people that had health insurance, right? So that's that's a group in population in the U.S. Um, not everybody has health insurance. And what he was able to do is look at what experiences might a child experience, have in their life that could lead to these medical conditions like heart disease, obesity, diabetes. What, like, is there a link? Are there like main things that, that could happen? You know, are they the things we think? Because I know like in the 90s when I started as a school social worker, there was a lot of talk about like, I remember hearing comments like, oh, that culture, they just don't value education. That's why these kids aren't doing well. Um, that sort of thing. And indeed, culture and race is not on the list, right? So he came up with a list of 10 adverse childhood experiences that could occur in a child's life that would lead to negative outcomes. So let's talk about how that would work. So a child then would be exposed to some sort of family or neighborhood or a societal risk factor. The things that he found were physical, verbal, or sexual abuse, neglect, either physical or emotional, parent criminality, drug and alcohol use from a caregiver, modeling of aggression then that could be domestic violence it could be um it could even be really violent um, movies and video games and even though people don't like to hear that people think that there's like disagreements on that and really scientifically there's not just showing kids this stuff however kids have different um kind of thresholds some kids things don't bother them as much as other kids for things like that parent death or divorce and a family member diagnosed with a mental illness. And if you go online and you can take the ACEs quiz yourself, there's, there's several questions and they asks it in a very, in a very um, clear way. So it might say something like, um, did you ever um, have a, you know, a caregiver go to jail um, on drugs or alcohol, like really specific, were you ever worried where your next meal was coming from, um, that sort of thing. And what ends up happening is a child is exposed to some of these risk factors that Felity found, one of the 10. And what ends up happening then is they begin to develop some short-term negative outcomes. Now, you're going to notice on this list that while um, race or poverty is not on the list, what ends up happening is kids that are raised in impoverished situations actually have like a storm of these things occurring. Um, you have situations where you have parents working multiple jobs. They're incredibly stressed. So the kids don't, um, sometimes they are exposed to like unsafe caregivers. Um, a lot of like um, lots of adults in the house say. And then they can be like exposed to some type of abuse from that. Um, you also end up with situations where parents, um, yeah, a lot of drug and alcohol is associated with poverty because of the stress of being poor. Um, and so a lot of these things kind of like merge together. Um, and that's where that kind of comes from that idea. And that's why low income kids, we, you know, have title one schools, we need to work extra hard in those kind of situations to help those children. So what happens is these short term negative outcomes, right? So kids start to behave differently when they're exposed to these things. So they might be defiant of adults because every adult in their life has let them down. They're not ready for school, maybe kind of coercive or, or manipulative with adults um, or with kids, because the only way that they know to get stuff done might be like aggression. Like no one's ever taught them a different way to get their needs met. So they'll hit 
or kick or cut in line right when they're little and lack of problem solving skills or at least not problem solving skills that we like to see at school so hitting is not a valid one really at school right um, running away we see that a lot right now after kids have returned back from COVID, they they go directly to flight you know they kind of like school i could give it or you know leave it or take it and they just decide to leave it you know i'm just going to walk out of the classroom now because i just not into this i don't have to right um, and so then you start to see kind of some maladaptive behaviors generated from students that have experienced that so truancy is really a flight right i don't want to be here you don't like me i don't like you i'm out of here um kids start to be rejected by their peers and their teachers i i think in my experience i've seen that by second grade um the kid with adhd or the kid misbehaving the kids kind of don't want to be around them as much they won't be as patient with that child and they start to reject their peers um, and then by middle school they all find each other right the deviant peer group they all sort of discover each other and hang out in a group um, low academic achievement, lots of office discipline referrals, and in PBIS, that's what we, we like count that to look at what's the behavior at your school, so you can like measure that. Um, these kids move a lot, so they change schools frequently. I remember reading one study that said every time a child changes schools, they lose four months of instruction. So you think about how many times these kids move. Um, early involvement with drug and alcohol, early age of first um, arrest, you probably would see then teen pregnancy falls in this kind of these outcomes. Then you have these long term outcomes that Vince Felity was looking for. So school failure and dropout, delinquency, drug and alcohol use, gang membership, violent acts, drug and, you know, uh, adult criminality. Um, dependence on the welfare system, higher death and injury rate. These are the people with diseases. These are people that get, get in car accidents, actually, because they take riskier moves, like riskier behavior, high su suicide rates, um, more likely to be addicted to um, drugs and alcohol. Um, so Vince Felity found that not only was it just obesity or heart disease, it was like all this other stuff. Um, problems with employment because they don't come to work all the time, right? So all this to say that adverse childhood experiences and trauma contribute to problem behavior in school. This is what you're seeing with a lot of these kids. And you have students that would have an ACE score of, of more than one or two. They might have like, like six. And the tipping point appears to be around four. But wait a minute. You might be looking at that list and you say, you know what, I've had at least four. I know when I've like done this, I've taught this to my graduate students and, and I've done trainings with ACEs and I've had, I one time had one lady just get up and leave in tears thinking like, you know, <laughs> what do I do? So there's a hopeful message because what the research has shown, there's this whole like research around risk, but there's also research around resiliency. And what the research shows is that, um, Resiliency study is like, what about some people means that they bounce back? Like some people have experienced you stuff, yet they're sitting in the room with you today. Look around, there's people in this room that had a score of four or more. They just have, right? I'm not gonna have you share out, but it's true. So what the research says is there's about three factors, main three factors of why people bounce back, why people are resilient. One of them is, um, do you guys remember Carol Dweck's work with grit? Um, there is like a mindset. Some people have a mindset that I can overcome this and a lot of very cool stuff. And you can actually teach that mindset to kids. And that's why um, some of the, the grit work and Dweck's work is just so great. Um, so there's that. Lots of cool research around people bouncing back because they, they know that they can like do better, overcome. You also have um, conversion experiences. You know, you think about all the stories of people that go to prison and then they um, they they begin like to, they have faith they find a higher power like aa um, they meet god these are very powerful and very real and turn people's lives around but not but and <laughs> the most common reason that people are resilient in their lives um and about i think the rates about 75 percent of the of the people that bounce back and turn their lives around is actually um and you're not gonna be surprised by this that one adult in their life took an interest in them, mentored them, cared about them, and um, supported them. One adult. And as a luck would have it, 
most of the time, that adult was a school, someone from school, not necessarily teachers. It might have been, a, you know, an aide or a principal, but most of the time it was a teacher. Now, there's some research with like youth pastors, pastors, um, great uncle, you know, those kind of folks, but most of the time it was a teacher. So when people are talking about PBIS, they're not talking about um, we're just going to hand out tickets and everything's going to be great. We're actually talking about science that's saving kids' lives. So that's a tall order. All right. But let's just kind of talk about how this can play out for you. So as you know, this is a little comic that's nice. Do I get partial credit for simply having the courage to get out of bed and face the world again today? Have you ever noticed that those kids with high A scores are the ones that always come to school? They never miss, right? Do you know why? Because you're the best thing they have going. And you know why they get all like crazy right before Christmas holiday, Thanksgiving? They act out because they're going to miss you. And they don't even, that it's not like rational. They're not thinking like that, but they're anxious about what they have to face for the next two weeks without you. So even now so here's our brain here's our brain on stress <laughs> right our brains are the same our kids brains and our our brains so we have our thinking brain neocortex lovely lovely and we have our emotional brain which gets hijacked the limbic system gets hijacked when we're under stress that gets flooded with cortisol when your stress like floods your brain you don't even have access to your neocortex you can't even think things through. This is not the time to be talking to kids when they're blowing out. This is not the time to try to get a teacher like, oh, we're going to have a restorative conversation when your teacher's really, really angry <laughs> or the kid, two kids are in a fight, right? We got to all cool off first, right? So when your brain is flooded with cortisol, we have to teach folks like calming procedures, things like that. That's really important. That's social emotional learning. But this is what gets hijacked. It's kind of people talk about your animal brain or your toddler brain gets activated when you're stressed because you're running from the bear, right? Thinking brain is what we need to do to do all this other stuff. But interestingly, let me just show you how this plays out at school. So they did a study on teacher stress levels. And what they found was that normally people's cortisol level is really high every morning because you got to get up and you got to get your coffee and you got to get to work. Everybody's is high in the morning and that's healthy. But people that are burned out um, actually have high cortisol rates all day long. It doesn't really dip for you people. So, and that's really, really bad for your health, right? So they did this study and they gave people a burned out questionnaire and people that met the criteria from burnout they did a swab and saw, found out how much cortisol they had in their system compared to teachers who didn't score high on a burnout scale. And what they found was that teachers with high cortisol levels throughout the day, they then took swabs and found out the cortisol level in their students. And what they found was that students in teachers' classrooms who were highly burnt out had matching cortisol levels. So your students will mirror you if your stress level is really high. So that makes us think that kid on the bicycle who's now experienced all this stress is not an easy kid to have in your class. And if you match it then with your own burnout, your own stress level, that kid does not have a shot in the world to recover and to have their needs met. Now, there's also just as there's a science of stress, and cortisol and stress response, there's also a neurobiology of trust relationships and connection. What happens when you have trust in adults around you or people around you is you have this oxytocin cascade and oxytocin actually opposes cortisol. It's as though it washes your brain. And this is the love hormone. So remember, we we're talking about all the things to finish your stress cycle. And there was things like connecting to people and hugging people. It actually releases a hormone in your brain, um, oxytocin cascade, because there's like a few, it's like a little cocktail, and it washes your brain and it makes you less stressed. And where, where it all comes from is trust, relationships, and connection. So now we're actually realizing that 
we actually could oppose the effects of cortisol by setting up environments in schools that promote trust relationships and connection. And that's where PBIS comes in and things like restorative practices, because we know that if you have strong relationships with your students, you have all of these wonderful things that happen. Higher academic achievement, improved attendance, higher grades, disruptive behaviors go away, kids don't drop out of school anymore, and anxiety drops and well-being increases not just for the kids, but for you. So we need to teach people how to have good relationships with their kids, right? So that they can engage in that lovely oxytocin that we want. And having these things occur in a school actually like can heal brains, which is so cool. And by the way, strong staff relationships lead to increased productivity, decreased illness, high engagement with work, and your anxiety going down, your well being increasing. And just kind of a little aside, which is kind of interesting, is if you have great relationships at your school, happy employees are 12% more productive. If you have close friendships at work, your employee satisfaction goes up by 50%. If you have a best friend at work, right? Think of that, everybody give a wink to your best friend. 36% of employees would give up five grand a year if they were happier at work. And employees who are happy are, um, they don't have, they're not sick. 10 times fewer sick days. And the one time on NPR, I also heard a study that said that to get an, a happy person to leave their job, if they like their colleagues, they have to get paid 20% more to even consider moving. And that is how much we value good relationships at work. So this is just adult relationships. So think about everything we're talking about and how much you need to not just attend to the kids, but attend to each other as well. So this is all the why, why, why. So this is Mrs. Muttner. Now, she liked to go over a few of her rules on the first day of school. Raise your hand if this is how you were raised. You went to school and you had these lists of what not to do. No skateboards, no hats, absolutely zero tolerance for fighting, <laughs> right? So when you have all of these things in your school and it's no, don't do this, don't do that. Now, Mrs. Muttner, she has no smart alecky remarks, no making stupid faces, no crying during tests, no coming in late, no coming in early, right? Research has shown that schools that are negative and punitive actually have the highest rates of vandalism, truancy, dropout, and aggression. So isn't that interesting? So you think about these high-risk kids that are already raised in very like stressful environments, Teachers that are doing their best by saying, no, 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 you actually get worse behavior. So that's not helpful, right? We need to do things differently than the way we were raised. That's what we know about that. Research has shown that zero tolerance policies, this is, you know, those signs that are all over schools, you know, no drugs, no alcohol, no weapons have been shown to make things worse. Zero tolerance policies have not been shown to be effective. However, they came out of good intentions. Around the mid 90s, we had passed the Gun Free Schools Act. I don't know if any of you remember that in your career, but the idea was we need to tell people not to bring guns to school, right? Seems logical. Yet what we ended up doing is making school behavior, behavior punishable in court. So it used to like be a phone call home, getting our parents involved, getting in trouble. Kids were getting arrested from school. And not only that, but they found that less than 10% of the time was it for like violent, like weapon behavior in nationally and small towns had higher rates of expulsions after the gun free schools act than big cities did. Um, so this is why we were raised with, you know, Mrs. Muttner saying, no, no, no. And then around the mid nineties, we said had the gun free schools act, which shifted how we handle discipline in schools, you know, zero tolerance policies. And we began to believe that we needed to use punishment and sanctions to change behavior instead of using relationships and trust and those kind of things, right? So we use them because you'll hear, hear people, we need to punish wrongdoing or we need people to cool off. You know, we need to like get space and time and we need to remove unsafe youth. Um, what will the other kids think if I allow this to go on? Right? These are all the things you hear. Turn to your partner and name something else that you hear, like why we have to punish kids. 
Okay. Does anybody want to share out something that came up in your conversation? Something that what you've heard people say, like, why do we have to punish kids? Why do we need to, to have sanctions? I'll share one. Okay. And then, um, because we have to teach them, we have to teach them that they can't do this later in life or they can't do it. Um, right. Yeah. You know, they can't get away with that when they're an adult. So we have to teach them. Okay. Right. So good. What else? It's the only way they're going to learn, learn not to do it. Right. Okay. Teach, learn. Good. Anything else come up that's different than that in your other rooms, you guys? Maybe we should get an elementary person to share and maybe a middle or high school person to share because you hear different things, maybe. Heidi Wagner wants to share. Okay, just <laughs> unmute and jump in, Heidi. We have one. Um, like we hear people say, what about all the other kids who are doing the right thing? Like, what does this tell them? Tells them that this is acceptable and that we are okay with this behavior. Right, right. Yeah, because there's an assumption there that if we don't punish, we don't, we're not doing anything. We do nothing, right? And it's, it's interesting if you actually talk to kids, if you actually talk to your students and see if that's true, turns out it's not. Those kids absolutely know that Johnny's having a miserable time of it. And if you actually were to, to meet with them, which it's difficult to do unless you learn like some pretty good restorative practices and things like that to talk to students that are impacted by the heart of another kid, they'll say things like, I think he's really sad or his dad is really mean to him, right? Like they'll know. Um, and if you really talk to students, they want to see that we can handle it. They look at adults and they say, why, why do you get so upset? Like when you yell at him, it makes me scared. You know, because it seems like you, you don't know what to do. You can't handle the situation. You don't make me feel safe when you lose it or you punish. And um, so we make a lot of assumptions about kids. In fact, what I just said that, that we think he's sad, that came from a second grade classroom when they had a restorative conversation about a kid that was, you know, knocking over stuff, hitting people. So it's not like we way underestimate children and how they know each other. But yeah, that's I love that you brought that one up. Anything else? Shazwick put one in the chat. Oh, good. Can you read it to us? Safety of other students around, mm -hmm. around their student, around the student. Right. And there are absolutely times that a kid's behavior outstrips our capacity to continue teaching, right? <laughs> like we cannot continue. This is, this is crazy town. Um, I, think I would have echoed that too, by the way. That's what I was going to say from the high school level is just, again, pattern of unsafe behavior for others. So at some point we seek alternative placement. Yeah, yeah. And there are kids that outstrip our capacity. Like they do need more services than we have, you know? And there's processes in place for those things and we need to build them for schools. Um, I think that the mistake occurs when we think that was treatment. And that's what Dr. Jeff Sprague comes. He talks about that. He was one of the inventors of PBIS. We'll talk about him in a minute. He's my mentor and a wonderful human being. But the, the error in our thinking comes when we say that by sending this child away from our community, whether out of the classroom or home on suspension, that that is treatment. That'll fix them. You go home to that same group of, you know, that same family that's raised you to be this way and you fix yourself you know, or go sit in the hallway and think real hard, you know, and, and in general, you know, Ross, Dr. Ross Green, Explosive Child, great book, he would say that children do well if they can. They do not want to be melting down on your floor. They do not want to be failing in your class, but it's all they know. It's what that sell the strategies, it's all the tools in their toolbox that they have. So what we need to be doing is responding with teaching and interventions and inclusion not sending them away. Um, so the thing is, the mistake comes that we believe it works. It feels like it works because in the short term, it's immediate relief. They're out of your classroom or they're out of your school that people think if that kid just wasn't at our school, everything would be better. And what ends up happening, and that can be kind of somewhat true, but there's, you know, I've heard it said that like within, if you have a, like a system, a culture, 
that child will be replaced within two months. Someone else will come and do that. So you have to have systems of support built in. And it attributes responsibility on that of, for change on the youth and their family, which remember that kid's already on that bicycle. If they were capable of doing it differently, they would. Zero tolerance has not been shown to improve school, climate, or school safety. It's a real picture of a real kid getting booked. And this was in the 90s, and it was crazy back then that we were arresting little kids for bringing sporks to school. I don't know if you guys remember that. Made us look ridiculous in the international, in the global stage of like, what is going on in America, right? Um, not been at all shown to, 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 you know, improve things. So remember, there's more of them than there are of us. We're going to change the entire school environment. We're not going to try to save just one kid at a time although we need to do that too, right? With the resiliency study, there's good news and we're gonna be able to um, shift things from negative to positive and transform our schools. For more information, go to lauramoyman.com where you can download free resources, watch free training videos, check out my online courses and connect with me there.